Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for coming out today. It's a beautiful Alaskan spring day. Thank you for being here today. The overarching theme for the month of April from the grassroots uh, ministers uh, endeavor to get all 360 some centers singing from the same sheet of music. Uh, that theme for April is where humanity and divinity meet. Um, I saw that and, you know, I thought, wow, if I had to come up with themes, I, it would take me a couple decades, I think, before I got to that one. And I, what I do when I get to those, I, I sort of set it aside and I do my own thing like I always used to. <laughs> but I, I got to thinking about that and it started to kind of resonate with me. And what I came up with sort of three ideas about that and the first one is what I call the fingerprints of the divine you've all heard that and I talk about how these things did happen and there isn't enough coincidence in the world to explain them the second thing that came up for me was not my circus not my monkey <laughs> and the third thing was the thin places so let's start off and talk a little bit about miracles, about um, the fingerprints of the divine and how they're so prevalent and yet we sometimes myth, miss them. So I'm going to ask everybody, since Linda checked and everybody has a church bulletin today, take your church bulletin and put it right up in front of your face. <laughs> right up there. And now look around. And what do you see? You don't see anything. You got a church bulletin in front of your face. <laughs> so now take it down and look around. And what do you see? You see a lot of smiling, happy people. Well, that's just what we do in our lives. We have all of the everyday things. Oh, the bills that are due, you got to get the kids up in the morning and their teeth brushed and care, hair combed and off to school in time. And you've got the car repairs that weren't planned for and all of the things that happen in our lives. And all of those things are just like walking around with a big church bulletin in front of your eyes because you can't see the things that are going on behind it. Now, Brother Kaleem likes to do the call and response thing. I've never done one before. Uh, so I'm going to try my first one today. So I'm going to say the first part of the sentence, and then I'm going to ask you to finish it. So, I can't see the forest for the trees. trees. Very good. Hey, that was easier than I thought. Kaleem, you're onto something. <laughs> and that's what happens. We've got all these trees right of us and we don't see what it is. Earlier this week, Ann and I uh, rented a movie, uh, Dunkirk. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it was good. It, 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 it's a good movie. It's not really my style, but it, it was okay. And I think it was nominated for a, an Academy Award or something or best performance by a key grip or I, some <laughs> some category I didn't know what it was but um, and, and it was good it was kind of a documentary it was pretty factual and it's a perfect example of what I'm talking about today because in that movie they looked at all of the trees and they never saw the forest they looked at all of the facts and the stuff and there was a little bit of a plot to it and everything but it never talked about the miracles the real miracles of Dunkirk. Let me set the stage for you. It was early in World War II. It was May of 1940 and Hitler had already made the advances to the east. Uh, he had already made some advances to the north. He already had uh, Finland and Norway under his control and now he was moving into a little bit more of Central Europe. And in order to help slow him down, the British sent a contingency of about 200,000 men to help defend Central Europe. The French had a contingency of well over 100,000, and they were positioned to try and stop where they thought Hitler was going to come. And they made a horrible miscalculation. And Hitler outflanked them, came in from the side. He had... Uh, 
1,800 Panzers, 1,800 tanks. He had 330 dive bombers, and he caught the Allies flat-footed. He came in from the side, and he trapped them. He destroyed the lines of communication, and the Allies were on the verge of a really big defeat. On May 24th of that year, with men all over Central Europe that were trapped and not knowing what to do, no uh, chain of command what to do, the orders were being spread, and the order was get to Dunkirk, and we're going to try an evacuation. Most of those men didn't even know where Dunkirk was. They had to walk up to you know, the people in the streets and say, where's Dunkirk? And they'd point, and they'd walk in that direction. It's the best they could do. But it wasn't Churchill in England that, camp, that stepped up in that moment. It was King Charles VI. And on May 24, 1940, King Charles VI got on the radio and he asked for a day of prayer, a prayer for the troops and a prayer for England. And this is what he had to say. Let us, with one heart and soul, humbly but confidently commit our cause to God and ask his aid that we may valiantly defend the right as it is given to us to see it. Man, that sounds a whole lot of like affirmative prayer that we teach at this center. I think King, King George was on to something there. But that fervor caught on. And people began praying all over Great Britain. On the 26th, three days later, the, uh, at um, Westminster Abbey, the Archbishop uh, led a prayer for the entire nation along the same lines, asking for protection of the country and safety for the troops. Now you're thinking, where are the miracles in this? Well, here come the, the miracles. Because there were actually four listed miracles. I've included a fifth. But the first miracle was that on May 24th, for some reason, Hitler stopped. The Blitzkrieg and the Panzers, everything pinching in. In fact, he made a radio announcement. Hitler did, and he said, we have the Allied troops surrounded, and tomorrow begins the annihilation. But it didn't. He didn't do anything for four days, starting on May 24th, the same day the king asked for the prayer. Now, I don't know if there's any connection or not. You can draw your own conclusion to that. The, the Germans stopped. 330 dive bombers stayed on the ground. 1,800 tanks stayed right where they were. When they resumed bombing three days later, created the second miracle. Because what happened is they bombed the city of Dunkirk, which things caught on fire and buildings were burning and, and you know the bombs put up all kinds of smoke. And this smoke drifted away from the city right down to the beach and spread along the beach and out into the water, into the shallow water, where the troops were trying to get out to the deeper water where the ships were that could take them and ferry them and rescue them and take them back to England. So the German dive bombers couldn't see the top, the, the targets below because of the smoke that they created. Now what are the chances that smoke flying right over where they needed to be? I think it's another miracle. The third miracle. The English Channel is known for being choppy for heaven really squirrely currents, there's things going on over. This is not, you know, a, uh, a pleasure boat paradise. <laughs> it's a it, pretty nasty place. But on that day, on those days, the English Channel was flat. It was as calm as a bathtub. <laughs> the fourth miracle. At the same time that King George was asking for prayer, Churchill was asking for volunteers, people with small crafts that could help ferry the troops to the deeper water where they could board ships that they could then be rescued and evacuated to England. 
they didn't have any way to get them there. And 850 what they call small ships showed up. These were average English people. There were yachts, there were fishing boats, there was every kind of boat you could think of. There were some rowboats out there. And they came across the English Channel and they were able to ferry these soldiers back to the bigger ships that had guns that could help defend themselves from the, from the bombers. 850 people showed up. None of them had any training. None of them had any uh, protection, any armament at all. And they almost all made it through the whole thing. And at the end, 338,000 Allied troops were saved and taken back to England. But there was what I consider to be a fifth miracle in there because when this happened the attitude in Great Britain was not good they had seen what Hitler had done how he had moved across Europe Eastern and Western Europe and there was fear and there was almost a sense of surrender but one historian wrote this after those 338,000 troops were rescued there was a feeling of determination not surrender Deliverance by a divine hand. It was exactly what the British soldiers and citizens needed to forge ahead. Fingerprints of the divine all over Dunkirk. And yet it's so easy to look beyond those or not to see those because we've got those trees in our face. We're looking at that with a church bulletin stuck on our nose. And when we can get that out of the way, then we can see those fingerprints of the divine. Not my circus, not my monkeys. That's a kind of a, a popular phrase among younger uh, kids today. And essentially it's what it means is it's none of my business. Uh, from my observations of the Younger ones I know, grandkids. Uh, it's accompanied usually with an eye roll and a, oh, <laughs> not my circus, not my monkeys. I'm not drama of this situation. Not my circus, not my monkeys. I thought about that in my initial reaction. Well, that's pretty good, you know, to step away from the drama, step away from all of that. But then the more I thought about it, you know what? What is that circus? That circus is life. And there is only one life. Yes, we each have our individual lives, our own part of that one life, but there is but one life, and that life is the life of God. And that life is your life, it is my life, it is each of our lives. And our lives are part of that circus. We're all in that circus. It is my circus. And those monkeys... Ah, those are the, the wonderful things, the people in our lives that challenge us, the people that we just don't like, <laughs> the people who are, uh, whose behavior we don't admire. And yet if we are all one, if we are all part of the one, then they are part of us. And sometimes it's their behavior that is a mirror for us. And the things that we don't like about them are the very things that we don't like about ourselves. No, I think not my circus, not my monkeys is false. In fact, oh crap, it is my circus and those are my monkeys. <laughs> Ernest Holmes in Anatomy of a Healing Prayer wrote, the search for divine unity, the the realization of unity necessitates the acceptance that there is no dividing line, that we shall expand, progress, evolve ad infinitum in a sequence from where we are to any stage that we shall ever become. Out of eternal being comes everlasting becoming. Those are our monkeys. Another time, Holmes wrote, 
The wick of your individual life runs deep into the oil of pure being. There is but life, and that life is your life now. It is our circus. As I was thinking about this and this whole idea of the, uh, the monkeys, I started thinking about the 100th monkey story. And that has pretty well been debunked, uh, Snopes and other places. But there are some elements of it that are true, very, very true. And I'm going to submit, if you remember from last week, uh, that uh, Arabic uh, preface to all of their stories. I don't know whether it happened or not. That's unimportant. What's important is the story. So just to make sure everybody's up to speed on this, a quick uh, precy of the story of the 100th monkey. Um, after World War II, uh, Japanese scientists studied the behavior of monkeys on some of the islands in the, in the Pacific. And there was a particular uh, strain of monkey and they, they watched this and they, they studied their behavior. They would deliver uh, bushels of sweet potatoes to the beach every morning and they would observe the behavior of the monkeys. And they did this on several different islands. And what happened is that one, they called her the genius monkey, got the bright idea and she took her sweet potato over to the stream and washed it off. So they didn't have the sand on it, so they didn't get sand in her mouth while she ate. And uh, then she got even more brilliant, and a few months after that, she took her potato out into the salt water, and she washed it off, and it got some salt on it, and it made it even taste better. So she would go do that, and after a while, finally one monkey watched her, and that monkey picked up its potato, and it went out and washed it. Oh, and it liked that salty flavor. It liked not having sand in it. And this concept of washing the, the potato slowly, slowly, slowly spread until it got to a certain point, and they called that the hundredth monkey. But at one point, instead of being a one monkey at a time learning, it took off. And all of the monkeys went to learning so, so very quickly. It was so prevalent, and this change in consciousness was so extent that monkeys on neighboring islands that had never seen the original monkey wash her potato started washing their potatoes in the water too. That's the part I think that has been debunked. That's the part that was not able to be proven was that the, that learning was able to jump islands. But that's not, the, that's not the important point. And in fact, actually, what I think the conclusion that they came to was it was all about demographics. The younger monkeys learned a lot faster than the older ones, and there was a population shift. A lot of the older monkeys moved, they went away, they went into other places, and the population became younger, 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 and they all learned at once. But the point is, is that when we can have a collective change in consciousness, when we can have a collective elevation of what we believe, that it can expand and it can change rapidly. The collective behavior elevates when each of us chooses to elevate in consciousness. Third point is thin places. Thin places. No, it's not that kind of thin places. <laughs> and it's not like Chile, a long country, thin. It's not that kind of thin places. Thin places are the places where we become aware of the divine, where we become aware that there's something greater, that there's something else going on. I have three places for me in Alaska that are thin places. One is in Homer. There's just something special about Homer. And you know, that south facing hill, um, the wildlife, the, the salt air, the ocean, the beauty of Kachemak Bay and the snow-capped peaks, it's just, it's so beautiful, it's just touching. And I feel a connection to a higher power there. Another for me is Talkeetna. 
And once you step away from the shadow of the Fairview Inn and you can look up and see Denali it is now, the majesty of the Alaska Range in front of you, you can't help but feel small and insignificant and yet a magical part of something that is so beautiful and so, so magnificent. And the third place for me in Alaska is the Brooks River. It's a small river in western Alaska. It's where bears go to feed on the salmon. And, and you see that cycle of life and, and the, how everything depends on a salmon and this interconnectedness of all of life. Those are places that touch me as thin places. An author by the name of Tracy Balzer wrote, any place that creates a space and an atmosphere that inspires us to be honest before God and listen to the deep murmuring of his spirit within us is thin, the thin places. I submit, Ernest Holmes wrote, there's a place in, it, in us which lies open to the infinite, but when spirit brings its gift by pouring itself through us, it can give to us only what we take. So as we allow that divine current to flow through us, when we can go to those thin places, it can only be as thin as we allow it to be. I think back to the Camino and how different places were thin places for me. And I, I remember the cathedral in Burgos. And I thought back about the generations and generations of, of workers that worked on that. There were some like six or eight generations of workers worked on that cathedral. There were people there knowing that their great, 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 great grandchildren would never see it complete. But they continued to work on it anyway. And there were those same people then, there were those ancestors later and later that knew that their great, 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 great grandfather had been working on this cathedral. And it seemed so beautiful and so profound to me. But it wasn't just the big places. The cathedral in Lyon really didn't do much for me. I don't, I don't know why. It wasn't the same feeling of that connection. Now, I had a really deep connection in a little tiny wayside chapel. It, it couldn't have held a dozen people. And there was a guy out front, and you know you could get your credentials stamped. You could do stuff there. But once inside, it was just so peaceful, so quiet could feel the presence of something greater. For Anne, we, uh, we started the day and there were two labyrinths, big ones, and, and one was all enclosed in fog and it was cold and windy and, you know, it was there, the fog was thick uh, and chilly right down to the bone. And, and walked the labyrinth and then we went on a pyre and we got up on the top and that's where the wind was. The wind was blowing and it was cold and I went over and sat on a picnic table and Anne walked the labyrinth and I realized that was Mother's Day. And in that moment, that was a thin place for Anne. So everybody's different in what a thin place is and what it means and what it can be. The thing that I want to leave you with today, the takeaway. When we can get the church bulletins out of our way, we can begin to see the presence of something greater. We begin to see the fingerprints of the divine and we can recognize that we are in our own circus and those monkeys are indeed ours. We become aware that the presence in our lives that when that presence is us, that that indwelling God is with us and is for us at this and in every moment, then the crooked road becomes a little bit straighter. We have a gentle wind at our back and our lives become filled with more meaning, more joy, more abundance. And it's all through the immutable law of mind. And so with our awareness of that power, that presence that resides within each and every one of us at every moment. I ask my colleagues, the practitioners, to join me in, 
in knowing the truth for our congregation. We just simply recognize that that power, that presence, that life is perfect. It is perfect in every way. And that as we live and move and have our being in this earthly plane, we know that, yes, the problems we face in this world are real. We know that there's a car payment due, that there's a house payment. We know that sometimes there's more month than there is paycheck. We know that health challenges can, can confront each and every one of us. We know that we all have relationship challenges, that people move on in their lives. Some people move away, some people stay. But we don't see behind that to the truth, the spiritual truth. And that is that for each one of us that have a health challenge, that there is a blueprint of perfection that is deep within each and every one of us. And that is that blueprint that we call forth. For those that are suffering, suffering financial challenges, we know that we live in an abundant universe. I think of those salmon, the millions and millions of salmon. So many salmon, you're standing in the stream and they run into your boots. There is plenty for everyone if only we can open up and receive it ourselves. And we know that more than anything else, when we show up in our authentic selves and allow that God presence to be within us, that we are beings of love more than anything else. And that every relationship is only God being God with God. Whether it be work relationships, romantic relationships, family relationships, it's all God in action. And so we just give thanks. And now I know that the words that I have just spoken are God's own capital T truth. I release these words to a working of law that always responds. I let it go, I let it be, and so it is.